Hi, I'm Amana with the Heart of the Soul podcast, and today I am here with Jamie, a beautiful, yeah, yes, beautiful redhead. I met Jamie several years ago. We were both working in the same hospital, and a mutual coworker of ours, we weren't in the same department, but this mutual coworker, Maggie, said maybe 15, 17 times, I don't even know how many times, it's like, you must meet Jamie. You guys would just like <laughs> click, and we were... Um, two of the, I think maybe there was a couple other people in our hospital doing Reiki at the same time, but it was, you were one of, you were the first other person that I met that right. did Reiki in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So, but it took like, I don't know, it was like months where people were saying we should meet and we weren't meeting. And then finally yeah. we did meet and connect. And then we were pregnant at the same time. Yep. And yep. yeah, now we have two little boys that are similar in age and are yeah, continuing on our friendship. And Jamie yep. has so much wisdom and knowledge to share. So if you want to take a moment, introduce yourself and talk a little bit about you and what you do and what you want to share. Well, I'm like I'm honest, I'm Jamie and I am a mom and a wife and I have um, a job. I work as an occupational therapist kind of part time, almost full time. Um, I'm a Reiki practitioner. Um, what else do I do? I do a lot of things. I try a lot of things. Aromatherapy. Um, aromatherapy, I do. Um, yeah, I don't know. Mostly busy being a mom nowadays and working. So I do like doing yoga, meditation, journaling, phone cards. Um, feels like most of my reading. I'm a, like a continual learner of anything that I'm like interested in. I have reading books all the time. Right now I'm into studying death doula work. So that might be my future. Well, it probably is later on when I'm a little older. So that's kind of what I'm focusing on outside of you know work. My work is in occupational therapist. Anyway, what else? Ask me questions. Yes. Well, <laughs> I can share I would, whatever. <laughs> yeah, before we jump on this call, like one of the things I'm most excited to hear at like length is your like conception, your like your okay. journey into motherhood, conceiving okay. Arlo okay. and you know, in through your birth and okay. postpartum right. motherhood, but I can ask you questions along the way or sure. we'll just see how you flow. Yeah. So I, I feel like when we're all, most people when they're little girls are like, oh, I want to have a bunch of kids or, you know, that kind of feeling. So I had that when I was younger. And then all of a sudden, as I got like 18, I was like, no, I don't want children. I'm going to be a blah. I'm going to work with people. I'm going to help people. I'm going to do that. So that was most of my early twenties was in college. I got a master's degree. I, work, I became an OT by the time I was 28. I worked, 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 no kids. I don't want kids. I don't want kids. I don't want kids. I'm never going to have kids. And then all of a sudden at 33, I was like, I need to have a baby. I think I need to have a baby. So I, I was in and you, were, you were married at that time already um, or not. No, I was not married. No. Okay. So I've known my husband since I was 19, <laughs> but we didn't get married till I was like 35. Okay. So in the meantime, I, yes, yeah, so we got married like at 30 years. I was kind of like, I'm going to baby. He's having now. So I've always kind of had problems with like my ovaries and like pain. And everyone's just like, you have cysts, whatever, you know, they ignore it. Take the pill. You're going to be fine. And I don't know. I was like, I don't feel like I'm fine. I feel like something's wrong. Like I just feel like something's wrong there. Since I was 11 or 12, I'd had pain on the right side. Right. I know a lot more now of what probably was going on, but no one teaches that stuff when you're younger. So I, kind of, it was just like a weird year. I turned like 33, I was 32, almost 33. And I, uh, working, I actually had two jobs. So I would work at the hospital and then I would go see kids in group homes after work from like 3.30 to four to like seven o'clock at night. So I was working like way too many hours and not taking care of myself and just doing, doing, doing. So I'm like, I want the money. I want all the stuff. I want everything. In the meantime, I was kind of feeling like I need a baby. So I had, I got a new car. I got rear-ended like two weeks after I got it. So my neck was messed up couldn't work my car was like brand new brand new car they didn't even make the parts for it so it's like oh we're gonna have your car forever so I was like oh my god devastated one you know something I shouldn't even care about but at the time I was like I love my staff um so that happened and then I would go to the chiropractor I would see her she adjusted my back one Friday and that weekend I was like in severe pain and I was like what is going on like I had to go to the emergency room so this is like kind of where it all starts. The emergency room, because I am like delirious, like going to pass out from pain, like heaving in the bathroom. My mom takes me to the emergency room. Um, 
the nurse practitioner or the PA was like, oh, I feel like you have ovarian torsion. So they did the CAT scan. She did the ultrasound. I'm like doped up on meds and don't even know what's going on. So the tests all show, yes, I have torsion. So what do you do when you have that? They call in the OBGYN. So four hours later, the OB comes in, <laughs> a man, God bless men, but he looks at me and goes, you know, well, there's no way because you're not in pain anymore. And he did his exam and my mom's like, what are you talking about? This girl can like tolerate more than anybody I know. And as I'm like crying, he's like, you don't have it. You have gas in your colon. Yeah, go home, take these pills. And an asshole. Doctor, right? So I was like, what the hell? You know, I'm like, no. So then it's like you, then it's like follow up with your gynecologist three days later. So I go see her. I'm like, she's like, oh, I talked to Dr. So-and-so. So yeah, you, should, you know, she's like, yeah, I don't really know what's going on. Just your GI, maybe you have Crohn's, maybe you have this, that. And I'm like, well, no, listen to me. I look like I'm four months pregnant. I have severe pain every day still. I can't even sleep on my left side. And then she looked at me and was like, oh, okay. Well, maybe we need to do surgery like we should have done, right? So I was like, mm-hmm. okay. Okay, and then I was kind of like surgery. I was like, no, I have an appointment with you in a month. I'm gonna think about it because I'm like, I didn't, I need my other thinker. I need to like stop and be like, is that what I want? Do I want another surgery? I don't know. So I'm like, that's a big deal. Like, going under. I don't know. So I thought about it and went back. I saw my naturopath in the meantime because she was working with me on the pain and all of the issues that you get from you know our diet and being on birth control and all that crap because you know you want to have a baby, so you want to be healthy. She was like, you should do it. Cause what if you have endometriosis? What do you have any other thing that may, can make you not have a baby? So I, I did it. Like, so this was probably like two months after the initial like ER visit and had surgery um, that was supposed to take an hour cause it was laparoscopic exploratory surgery. Um, four hours later, <laughs> the, you know, the, uh, I had ovarian torsion basically. By the time they got in there, the overly necrotic and dead and supposed mm-hmm. to like hooked to my colon. So they had to actually cut me open to take it out. And so who had to assist my doctor was the man who told me to <laughs> go home and, and follow the GI doctor because that's her meant was her mentor. And so she wasn't able to do that kind of surgery on her own. So how interesting that the person that told me I didn't have what I had had to come in, right? Had to come in and save the day, right? So that's year when I turned 33. <laughs> So I was off work for like three weeks, I think. Anyway, so then yeah, was how like, was wow. the recovery for that? Was that yeah, it's like having a hysterectomy. So wow. you know, then you have everything's moved around in there. You know, they laparoscopy and then like incision you down on your bikini line, just like you know, take out took out part of my fallopian tube and my ovary. And then yeah, so it was interesting. I was like, okay, this is when I started to be like, I really should listen to my body and like tell people that I know it because it's mine. And it's not your, you know, just the tests actually show that I had it. Like the woman doctor there, or he believed it and felt bad that she had to send me home because it's, it should have been an emergency surgery. Instead, I could have went, I could have went septic and like died, right? That's like the, yeah, the worst thing happened. So instead I have one, I lost an ovary. So as the year goes on, I'm like, okay, I, my naturopath is going to help me heal me. We're going to do all this stuff so I can get ready if I need when I'm ready to have a baby because I'm not now because I just had surgery, right? Okay. So then a couple months later, all of a sudden I'm like, wow, I really can't hear out of my left ear. Just like suddenly like went away. Great. Okay. Sudden severe hearing loss because of all the stress earlier. So 33. Okay. Still need to work on stress. Still need to work on food. Still need to get back in my body. So what am I doing? I'm doing yoga. I'm doing meditation. I'm starting to do all of those things. Like twice a week, I would go to yoga classes. I've been on like every diet, like whatever, cutting everything out and all that stuff. So still thinking like, oh, you know, I want to have a baby. I should have a baby. I should want to, I want to have a baby. So eventually my husband got, he also got laid off of his job. We weren't married yet. So then he went back to school. It's like a nine month program. Once he got done, then we got married. Yep. So that was in May of 2015. Yeah. So by then I was feeling a lot better. I was doing a lot better. Just generally like balancing my life better. I gave up that other job (laughs) that I had that was like way too much. And then I'm trying to think. Oh, so I, when I was doing a meditation one day, I was in my room and I was meditating and I, I saw like my son's face come to me. So it was like, 
I was like, oh, there he is. I see him. Like, I know I'm just going to have a boy. I'm only going to have one baby. I'm only going to have one. It's going to be a boy. I just know it. So that was like that year. That was probably like 2014. I kind of saw him. I'm like, he's there. But I, I was planning. He's going to come when I'm 37. So I want him at 37 because I'm telling him what to do. Right? I'm telling him what to do. He's going to come then. But, you know, the universe has its own timing, which I always kind of, yeah. So needless to say, I, um, at summer of 2015, we got married, we had lots of fun, hanging out, doing whatever. And then, um, September rolls around and I was like, I was at a baby shower and I was like with my friends and I was like, oh, I feel kind of weird. Like, and I was like, wait, I was supposed to start my period like two weeks ago as my boobs, like, like, oh, this doesn't feel normal. I was like, this is super weird. And I had a friend with me and I was like, yeah, I gotta go. I was like, remember, like, I'll just gotta take you home and like go. I'm like, this, I was like, what if I'm pregnant? I've never been pregnant. I don't even know what it's like, but I'm like, I usually have a period like every four or five weeks, like the same cycle. So then I was like, I took a test and I was like, nope. And I like threw it. I'm like, it, that doesn't really, that doesn't say positive. That'd be weird. Chuck, you're coming at 37. No, you're, I'll have you at 37. And so then I waited till Monday and I'm like, I, my friend that I was with on the weekend, I was like, okay, so I think I'm going to be pregnant. She's like, oh my God, we need to go to ride it at lunch break. So like at the hospital, <laughs> in the bathroom, I'm like getting on sick and she's like, it's positive. And I was like, okay, it's, it did say that the other day, but I wasn't believing it. Cause I was like, no, I'm going to have my 37. I have one ovary. I shouldn't even have the baby. Like, I don't even know if I ovulate right. <laughs> Cause every time I was testing, it was like, not what I thought it would be for ovulation. I'm like, eh, we'll just let it go. I don't know. So anyway, that was it. Right before my birthday. I think it was a week before my birthday. Two weeks before I turned 36. So. And when is your birthday? Here we are. And then you call the doctor and they say, we'll see you, you know, whenever. Right? Any questions about that part? The other part that I, I know that you're interested in too is like, so my husband, his father died when he was like a toddler. And we have lots of pictures of him in my room. And as I became more open to like Reiki, so I did learn Reiki in 2014. So I guess I didn't say that. So in that journey of like healing and after surgery and all of that, I, I have a coworker, I had a coworker that was older that I, she like mentored me in on spiritual things. And like, she always bring up Reiki, Reiki, Reiki. And I'm like, what is this? I want you to do it to me. And she's like, no. And I was like, well, I'm going to find somewhere to do it on my own. So I found somewhere and I called and the lady's like, I got one spot. Why do you want to do it? And I'm just I like, because I just need to, you know, I need to, I'm somebody who needs to do this. And so she's like, I'll let you in then. So I did, I did that training and it was like, I'm level two. So like, you know, I can do it with people, other people on myself. And so it was an interesting training. Cause like, she just like to be like, okay, and you over there. And we'll point, you know, she's like, you need to read this book. And I'm like, what? Okay. The, it's like light workers. I'm like, okay, I don't know. I'll read it. Or like, I wanted to be first. And I'm like, she's like, why do you want to be first? I don't know. I just want to be first. But I wasn't very intuitive. I, I was intuitive, but not. Like, I, people could tell I was, but I have like no idea. What, I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. I just want to learn this stuff and, and learn how to do it. So anyway, now I forgot why I was telling you that. But um, anyway, I learned that in my journey because it's helpful. Yes. And oh, then yeah, you were yeah. going to speak, you were starting to talk about your <laughs> father-in-law. Yeah. So anyway, once you open up to the energy, so yes, you'll have to get yeah. that. So I, at nighttime a lot, like I, when I'm falling asleep or like when I'm laying down at night is when I get a lot of like energy coming at me or things, or I just see things or like feel things is like usually when it is. So I'm an internal sensor. So I, I would prefer to do things with my eyes closed because then I can see with my third eye or I can feel the vibrations, vibrational energy. So there would be, I would be getting these like energies coming from the pictures on the wall towards my bed. Always like, oh, I don't know. I could say like almost every night, almost every night, almost every night. I would just feel that energy. And so then I did notice like, oh, after, after I got pregnant and when I had Arlo, I didn't really, I don't have it anymore coming from that, those pictures. So I was like, there is a reason why it was like, I need to come back. I need to tell you or something because what, you know, interesting enough. Out of the Taurus, and so is Arlo. So it's like they're both they're like a couple days apart. So I'm like, there's part of part of that energy is back, and, I, and it would be weird not to know someone in your family. I think too. So anyway, that was I always feel like that's a cool a cool thing to know. I'm like, oh, energy is energy comes from wherever, and if you're open to it, you can listen to it. And I was more fearful in the beginning because I didn't really under I I didn't understand that I should be open to that or like, oh, that's what's happening now. Like that's like, oh yeah. It was like, no, you need to have a baby for your husband. Like, really? Because I, I was like, you know, 
sometimes we have babies for us because we're meant to have the babies or we're meant to have them for other people or whatever it is. Love mm-hmm. the boy. But yeah, it was just that like energy is coming in. Energy, I feel it. No, I don't yeah. feel energy. But anyway, that was cool. It sort of opened you up to this other realm of yes, this type sure. of work. Yeah. Yes. So I mean, like that's what I'm like meant to do. So, and then, so I'm pregnant. Anyway, go back to that. Friend, what was his I pregnancy didn't. like for you? Were you sick? <laughs> were you happy? Were you? I, yeah. So yeah, then I was like, weird, huh? I don't know. Someone was like, I didn't plan this. I'm like a planner. I do planning. And so I was like, okay, pregnant. Go to the doctor. They're like, yeah, you're pregnant. And, you know, I'm like, okay. So I'm going to the same place. The woman that did my surgery, all that stuff. So I actually had like a hyperthyroid for the first month, which, you know, so I had lots of energy when people are usually like, dead in bed and they never had any morning sickness so that first trimester you know it's that weird thing where I'm like I I, I work in the medical model but I'm like I don't really know if I trust it and then I, I I'm open to like natural things and that so I was always torn because I you know my mom was a nurse so it's like you learn like oh you do what the doctors say and I'm kind of like I don't do what anyone says I, I don't want to so I go in and my lab work is like oh everything's great except like you have hyperthyroid I'm like well that's you don't really care well no I was like, well, that's, well, you don't care. Like I'm pregnant. That's weird. So then when I went to my naturopath, she's like, well, what if you have all these other things wrong with you? Let's check that out and make sure, because that would be horrible if you had like an autoimmune disease and you lost your baby. I was like, yeah, why wouldn't they do that at the, at the doctor's office? They just said, as long as your eyes aren't bulging, you're fine. <laughs> okay. And then she looked at me and said, oh, but if they, if, if they do, you better let us know. I'm like, okay. So yeah, first trimester, totally fine. No problems. I was still going to yoga. I was working. My friend was like, well, you look like really like me. I'm like, I'm sure I probably did. I don't remember. I, I didn't really sleep a lot, but I didn't need to. So then the second trimester, it went fine. You know, you're going to appointments. They're checking you out. I didn't have any problems. Um, although they did always say, like, I did have this, like, uh, I had to do the glue test test more than once because Arlo's um, belly was so big. So they're like, maybe you have diabetes, <laughs> but he didn't, like we didn't. I just, he just had a big gut and they're like, that's a sign. So I'm like, okay. So I did that. Um, that was the only thing. And I never had, I didn't really have any problems. I didn't, I only gained like 25 pounds. Like it was all just like baby. Um, I worked, yeah, I really honestly, I had a good time. I didn't really, I felt great. I was like, this mm-hmm. what I'm supposed to do. He's here. We're yeah. gonna, did you, you know? feel like energetically connected to him as well? Oh yeah. I do. Like I know him. Well, I, I had a, I had a reading like on my 39th birthday and she was like, have you ever met your soul tribe? I'm like, no, just my son. <laughs> like, he, like he, yeah, that's probably the only person at that time I was like being like, oh, I probably knew him before. Like, and you know, every time he's ever been sick, I like knew it like hours before he was like, I could just tell I was going to mm-hmm. wake up now. I'll wake up and be like, what's going on in his room? Like I just like connected. Yeah. So yeah, my pregnancy wasn't really, I don't know, you can ask me and see if there's something that comes up, but I didn't really have any during pregnancy. It was like fine. I did not take any classes. I read one book that that was a mindful mama book. So she was like a doula. So I read all about that, like just kind of mm-hmm. like how to do natural things if you need to, but I didn't really have anything to do. I didn't even yeah. really get swollen. Right. But it sounded like you were also like quite confident in your body and its abilities and that you would be able to birth your baby. Like I think a lot of women have this fear around labor and birth and wondering if they're capable or things like that. And from what I'm hearing from you is you didn't have those you had. No, so like the the books I read or, or I did like hypnobirthing, like I just find things and listen to it. And I was like, well, I, I didn't really feel like I couldn't do it. And honestly, the doctor I saw on her like nurse or midwife or whatever, they like never acted like I couldn't. And they didn't ever actually ever talk to me about anything like the birth plan at all. Nothing. They would just go and they check me, they measure me like things are right. Okay. I mean, my mom and all of her sisters did have incompetent services. So I did have them check for that. Cause like, the, you know, my mom almost lost me when she was five months old, five months or five months pregnant. She had to get stitched. And like all of her sisters had like either preemies or like, you know, stitched up. And they're like, oh, people with red hair. Yeah, they can go fast. I'm like, okay. So we checked it. And I was fine. Like, you know, I got my dad's jeans apparently for that. So that was the only thing I was like, I just want to make sure because I don't want to, you know, I wouldn't know what to do if that happened. That probably, yeah, that was horrible. So 
that was like the only thing I could think of that I was kind of like I don't know but after that I was like okay I'm fine okay I'm fine yeah and, and how I, go ahead I was just gonna ask how his labor began for you no I was gonna say so um when was it my due date was May 13th so let's see so on May 5th Cinco de Mayo May 5th would have been my like appointment where it's like your 40 weeks or whatever I saw my actual doctor and she was like wow you're ready to go I was like all right she's like of course, this is the kind of the sad part is before she checked the schedule to see who was on call, I let her strip my membranes. So the letdown was she came back and was like, Oh, Dr. So and so is on call. The yes. guy, yeah, the yeah, so the, the guy, guy who didn't believe you, home. yeah, they did believe me that um had to help me. And I was like, Ugh. That's kind of, I was like, Really, really, I was like, I think he is. I was like, I should have let you look before I let you do that. So I was like, oh, well, I'll just go to work because it's hour in the morning. Um, I guess I should Wow, have you're such a trooper. Yeah, strip your membranes kind of like, and go to work. Yeah, go, go. And so, stripping yeah. your membranes for anyone who doesn't know is where <laughs> a provider like puts their fingers up inside your cervix and like scrapes along kind of the baby's head and sort of stretches the opening, yeah. your yeah. cervical opening. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess I did like at eight months, Arlo, I was like, I feel like he's not moving as much. So this is another thing that I was kind of like, how do regular like doctors not get this? Like, so then it was like, oh, well, we better hook you up to the monitor. And I was there for like two hours. Cause like, we don't like the readings. And then I was there going, he just fucking moved down into my, he's right. He's moving down. And because yeah, they, it's just like, they're so like, like engaged and yeah, like I, we can only do what the book says. We can't make oh. any you know, so you got to get hooked up. And I was like, I should have probably never said anything because he's fine. He was, I didn't feel as much movement because he was scooting his head down. He was, mm-hmm. I was like, I had to four for like, you know, like a month or whatever. So I'm like, yeah. oh, he was just scooting on down. Okay. So anyway, so she strips my membranes on a Friday. I go to work. I'm like, well, you know, I'm kind of feeling like, <laughs> it feels like cramps. It feels like you're having very cramps, honestly. I was like, I probably should just go home. So I did like what I needed to do because I'm an overworker and I like feel like that's what I should do or used to. It's a weekend, do my normal thing, get in the room ready, get all my bag ready, go to Costco, run into people I know. Um, Sunday night rolls around, go to bed. I wake up at, I think it was 12.30 with like the, like the super like, and I was like, whoa, what was that? What was that? Okay, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. So I go to the bathroom like, okay, that was really painful. It felt like I peed my pants, but I don't know. like. I never had any blood problems when I was pregnant. Nothing, whatever. Mm-hmm. He was like sideways or something. I don't believe. He was like, mom, I won't sit on it. Um, so then I was like, okay, I'm going to go back to bed. So I went back to bed. Like 20 minutes later, oh, I was like, okay, wait. Mm-hmm. All right, I'm going to get up. So it must have started around midnight. So I got up. I'm like, I'm going to do, I'm just going to be fine. I'm just walking around. I'm like, I'm like laboring in the kitchen, like laying over the bar, like, holy crap, they're getting like closer. But I'm like, I can do this. I can do anything. I can do anything I want. I'm trying to get on my ball. I'm like, holy, you know, our, I think at 1 30, I ended up 1 30 or around two, I, I like woke up. I'm like, okay, I'm done. I was like, help me. I need you to help me. I'm trying all the things, getting on the floor and the ball. I'm like, this is not, I can't. Like, none of this is fun. I mean, I was at home. I think when we, then finally I was like, will you count them? Like, we didn't take a class or anything. He's like, they're like a minute apart. I'm like, oh, fuck, we gotta go. We gotta go. As I'm in there, like, I gotta change my clothes though, because I gotta wear something different, you know. And my, um, I'm sure my water broke and like all that stuff, whatever, because I was like bleeding all that stuff, whatever. So that probably happened somewhere between like, 12 30 and like 1 30 or whatever two so yeah I think we left around we got to the hospital I think at three so I labored at home for like not very long mm-hmm. and then of course it's the middle of the night I'm like just you have to go in the ER and I'm like I'm having a baby and I'm like are you sure I'm like I'm having a baby you know like are you sure like, yeah the fact yeah. that they I'm can sure. ask I'm you like, oh, I'm not like I'm in the car I was like oh my god I can't even sit down it's like got it yeah. So then we get there and they like wheel me from the ER. So the hospital I had him at was not where we worked. Cause I was like, I want to go somewhere where you stay in the same room the whole time, which most hospitals don't do, which is weird. And obviously I'm having to be at the hospital cause I'm like older and I'm like, I've never done it. And I'm just feeling like, that's what I do. Now I know I probably could have done it at home, but that's okay. So they wheel me like all the way across the hospital. I'm trying not to like yell because it's like yeah sitting in the chair like eh. then then I get they get me in the room I feel like it's three something at this point it's gotta be three 
And the nurse is like, okay, I need you to go give me a sample. And I was like, I looked at her, I go, if I sit on that toilet, I'm pushing the baby out. And she was like, huh? Huh? Go, no, if I sit on the toilet, I'm going to push. And she was like, oh, you better lay down. And she checks me and she's like, you're highly than that. And then I go, yeah, I want to push the baby out. Like, no. Like, I just went from like, you know, in three hours, I like went almost all the way. So then, of course, she's taking forever to start my Aggie because I have red hair, you know, and can find a goddamn vein, save her life in a redhead. So I have like, you know, I'm just like, whatever. I'm focused on pain over here. And they're like, did you call the doctor? I'm like, no, I didn't call the doctor. Call the doctor. Like, I didn't know you're supposed to call the doctor while you're in severe pain and like have the baby. Who the fuck thinks about that? That's weird. So then they had to call them. I remember I kept going like, when's he going to be here? Because I knew it was Dr. So-and-so. Yeah. Here. I don't know. He lives in Liberty Lake. That's only 10 minutes away from here. I'm, I'm in the valley. Yeah. So the nurse, you know, it's like, oh, this is so, yeah. She's like trying to find that she gets an IV. And I was like, okay. And then I was like, and then I think the charge or somebody else came in at some point and they're all like, oh, she's like, oh, okay. So like, do you want, do you want an epidural? I go, I'm daddy tonight. No. Are you sure? I'm like, no, I'm fine. Like, seriously, if I'm, I'm fine. Can I push? Cause I just want to push. I guess you can push. That's fine. So it's like, okay, I'm going to push. So it's like, they're like, the doctor's not here, but it's fine. So we pushed for a little bit. She taught me how to push and breathe. So I'm like, isn't that their job? I, I mean, I figured somebody there would be able to teach me or show me. Yeah, you push and hold or whatever. So then, you know, my husband's helping me. We get it down. They're doing their thing. Um, the doctor comes in around four. He's like, hi, I've never met you before. And I'm like, yeah, you have. And he's like, oh, we have. So it's your first baby. It's probably going to take about two hours of pushing at least. Okay. I'll be back. All right. See ya. You know, because the nurses do most of the work anyway. Yes. So we're in there pushing, pushing, pushing. And the nurse at one point, my husband are talking and I serious because I said, right, I'm an internal like sensor. I look up at her and she's like, you want me to stop talking? Yeah, I do. <laughs> Shut up. You don't yes. small chit chat over me. I'm trying to push a baby out. Yes. And how did the pushing part of labor feel for you? You know what? I, there's no pain with pushing. I didn't feel like there's any pain and I was on my back, but to be honest with you, that like felt the best anyone when I was trying mm-hmm. all of these other things. I'm like, yeah, oh, like I, this is the way that my body wants them to come out. So it's, it's fine. And you have your legs up and they're holding them or mm-hmm. yeah, I think the, yeah. So, and then my husband would do the counting, remind me and to breathe or all that stuff. And, you know, they're coming in going, do you want to have a girl? I think she said three, asked me three times. And I was like, no, seriously, th- just leave me alone. Where's the doctor? <laughs> so um, at one point, I don't, so maybe around 5.30 or something, he might've came, the doctor came in because they're like, you're getting closer. We can see his head and all that stuff. And um, I feel like, I know I looked at the clock at like 5.40. This is in the morning a.m. And I looked at the clock and I was like, oh, this baby's coming out at six. All right, my life path number six. Six is a special number for me. He's coming out at six. So he did come out at six. But in the meantime, at some point while I'm pushing, um, you know, the doctors do their oil thing and they rub and they do all that stuff to try to help you open up or the nurse does, you know, whatever. So at some point when I'm not in any pain, they're checking a million times because they're like, oh, you're not in pain. This is super weird. Women have babies and they're like in pain screaming or whatever. I'm like, oh, well, I'm not. I'm pushing. I don't feel pain. I mean, it feels actually what it feels like is you're, have, you're pooping like you're constipated and trying to poop. That's really what it feels like. And because I had that surgery, my right side's a little numb. I don't have as much sensation. So I really mostly felt it on the left. The ring of mm-hmm. fire was like half, you know, I don't know if I had that. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Like I could kind of feel somewhere on the left, but my right side, cause they cut through muscles and nerves and everything. It's kind of a little bit off on that side. Mm-hmm. I didn't really feel a lot of that. I didn't really have a lot of pain. Um, so between five forty and six or whatever, when the doctor was in there, all of a sudden I was like, wow, that really hurt. What, what just happened down there? What did you just do? And he's like, Oh, like he's seriously peeing on me without asking. And I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> so I was like, that hurt. So that hurt more than anything, which I mean, it wasn't even that bad of a pain. It's like steamy, burning, whatever. But I was like, seriously, like, I thought, whatever. That's obstetrical violence. I know. So yeah, it comes up later in my life sometimes. I'm like, oh, let's think about that. But so yeah, so that, and then I had him. Um, I was so eager to hold him. I was trying to like pull him up on my chest. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait. So it was exciting. He came out, cried, did all the stuff this was to do. And I was super excited. And I'm not a crier for happy things. I'm excited. I'm like, yay, where's my baby? He's a little nugget. He's a little small, he's a little small guy, 19 inches, seven pounds, eight ounces, I believe. Yeah. 
but yeah, he's so cute, cute, cute. Um, so then I did like birthing the um, placenta was hard for me. Like I didn't want to come out. So I had to do all the, uh, I felt like that was harder to birth than the baby or the mm-hmm. like massaging and it mm-hmm. just longer. It wasn't moving as fast. And then it is interesting how you have to like get stitched up. So I had like secondary hairs. Mm-hmm. And they're sewing and I'm like hey how many stitches down there they won't even tell you they're just like oh a dozen and I'm like well it would be nice to know it's my body right this whole thing is like it's my body Don't yeah be honest with you about your body so yes it's a in. very interesting culture that we're in right now with the medical system especially in obstetrics where they mm-hmm. oh and the the part of practice yeah so the baby was probably was birthed by the doctor that years ago had told me I didn't have torsion and had to do my surgery so he did come in. I mean, when he did come back in, he was like, oh, we have met before. But he didn't say anything about like how or why. He was like, oh, we have met before. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So it was interesting though that, so I birthed him and I didn't have any problems with him latching and for nursing or anything. Like he just, we just know like, hello, let's do our job. You know, we did it. Um, I didn't, I had to, I didn't know, like I had him at six in the morning. So they're like, you have to stay till tomorrow at six because you have to do the test for the whatever, whatever. I was like, can I go today? And they're like, oh no, you have to stay. You know, I, I was like, well, which I isn't actually know. true, but they make you feel like you have to stay. Yeah. yeah. I wish I would have known that, you know, I was like, cause I feel ready to go. Like there was, I didn't sleep at all there mm-hmm. because where I had him, they don't, they have NICU trained nurses and then they have a nurse for the mom. And uh-huh. so if one of them wasn't coming in one hour, the other one was coming in the other hour. Mm-hmm. So, and then they're always like, you're not sleeping. I'm like, how can I sleep when one of these coming in every hour? Yeah. Well, you're not going to sleep with the baby in the bed. Well, I'm not sleeping because one of you comes in every hour. Like I'm not sleeping and who cares who's my baby? I can have him in the bed with me if I want. Yes. Like, I know. I was like, well, what the heck? This is crazy. Yeah. I had him when I was up out of bed within like, two, I think two hours when the day shift nurse came home, I got up and I went to the bathroom, got everything, you know, what you're supposed to do so you can go home. Yeah. And then that, that whole day, it was like the nurses and the doctors were like, oh my gosh, this she birthed the baby without any epidural or drugs. Like she actually pretty much had a natural birth as you can have in the hospital. Right. So it was just, everybody's just like, wow. Which is, yeah. Like so rare. I was like, this is weird. Like everybody could do this if you would allow them to say no, but there's that point. I think I made it past that point where you're feeling like you need pain medicine. Even though I was like, I don't, I don't really like to take medicine like that anyway, but mm-hmm. a lot of people would break down because it is pretty painful when you're transitioning. And that's the part when I was like, well, wake up, puppy, I need help. And it's like, yes, and especially when people are offering it. it to you over and yeah. over again. Yeah. Like, I totally understand why women do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So any other questions about that? The um, so then you did get to go home. I did. So and the then day, what was postpartum like for you? You said that nursing went smoothly, so natural, easy for you. Yeah. Yes. So we just got it down. You know, any problems latching or anything. So, okay. so, you know, you have a baby and then you're supposed to be the pediatrician by within the first week. <laughs> well, that's what they told me. They wouldn't let me leave till I had an appointment. So that was what I had to do. And his hearing test, which would be obviously fast and stuff. So I got into the, an office and we saw that Friday, we saw it was a nurse practitioner who honestly I would never go to again. She didn't make eye contact with me or my husband. She looked at the baby and was like, oh, we need to give him formula because he's dehydrated. And yeah, and you need to bring her back on Saturday to get weight. And I was like, no, I'm not. I have an appointment. With, well, the lactation consultant saw me in in the hospital. And so I just made an appointment with her the next Monday, which mm-hmm. I feel like was really helpful because otherwise I wouldn't have known when I saw her that I wasn't producing enough milk. It wasn't like anything wrong with him. She was like, you're like 36 hours behind normally, like what woman would be at. So he was a little dehydrated, but she didn't make me feel like I had to give him formula to get caught up. She's like, no, just pump and feed him, pump and feed him, pump and feed him. And then your milk will come in, which it did. And so every time I saw her, he gained weight. I saw her like three times. She showed me how to pump, like use my pump mm-hmm. just to activate, you know, and she gave me a bunch of supplements to take, which helped. Like, so I, he never had a problem. He just kept growing. And I'm like, if I would have listened to that lady, I would give him chemicals, which I didn't want to do. I didn't really need to do that. I mean, he did a little breastfeeding jaundice and I looked at it, but I'm like, but he's fine now. He's fine. I feel like all of them do get that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he did fine with breastfeeding. And he was the kind of baby that he was so sleepy, I would have to wake up. <laughs> I have to wake him up. I'd be like, oh, I need to wake him up. My boobs are full. He hasn't woke up. It's been six hours. What? Yeah. So I did kind of do that every two hours for a while. And I'm like, okay, sleep's important. Mm-hmm. I was off work for four months. 
So, yeah, it's kind of hard to think about. Like, one, what, this was so long ago. Yeah, yeah. I saw him every two hours, and then I think it was, like, every three. He never really woke up. I would have to wake him up. Mm-hmm. Kind did of he his... continue on being a super good sleeper? Yes, he is. And when he's not, I'm like, what's going on in the universe? Are you sick or something? <laughs> yes, he still is a really good sleeper, except not at school. He does not nap, but I'd rather have him sleep at home at night. So, yeah, and I nursed him for, he just like kind of stopped asking for it. When I went back to work, I pumped like two times and I would feed him before and after work and then before bed. And then in the nighttime, I'd wake him up once. And then at some point, he was like 22 months. He just like stopped asking for it at night. And I was like, at that point, I'm like, I don't really feel like I'm making any milk. But, you know, he just kind of like went to sleep on me one night. And I'm like, okay, do it the next night. I'm like, okay, so I'm probably done. And he stopped he stopped wanting to take, I had a nanny, so he stopped wanting to take a bottle with the breast milk in it anyway. Mm-hmm. So I don't know mm-hmm. if he just was, he likes to eat. So if he was eating food, he prefer it. And I was like, you need my milk. Like you, you, I still have some in my freezer because I don't want to get rid of it. <laughs> I held it's on to milk work. for a long time too. I know. Yeah. Yes. I was I like, like, I can't just put it in the garbage. I like no. let it, I might put it, in like, put it on the earth. Like, yeah. it's like, this at least feels... <laughs> Yeah, it's like, so it's like a lot of hard work that I'd be like throwing away that was like, you know, my time pumping. Yeah, yeah. so after, and I didn't really have any, so I feel like I did really good. I did really good after that until like, probably once he stopped nursing, then I feel like maybe after my hormones, like my hormones like probably tanked after I stopped nursing. And then I kind of was more like, oh, I feel weird then, like, cause I was probably getting good hormones because I was making milk. And then I was like, that weird feeling for a little bit that I think and then just being a mom and working like mm-hmm. I feel like now that he's older I'm back back on track but they were just like that weird I'm kind of down I don't want really an irritation all the time and I'm older so I don't know if my mom mm-hmm. will back you know bounce back as fast as somebody who's in their 20s mm-hmm. so but yeah feel better now but then I wasn't doing anything for myself either what, that's what I was what gonna was ask like self-care doing. type Mm-hmm. All that stuff I would do did before that got me there. I wasn't doing any yoga, no meditation, no journaling. So when I was 39, so like a year ago, I went, like I had, was, you're just doing everything for whoever. You're not doing anything for yourself. My friend sent me an email and she was like, hey, there's this yoga festival. I can't go, but maybe you should. And I was like, huh, it's on my birthday. I'm turning 39. I was like, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. I haven't done anything for myself forever. So I went and I did like a astrological reading and then there was a girl that did like Reiki. And so I was like, those are the two things I'm going to do. I don't even care about doing a yoga class. I don't have the energy, even though it's like, I probably should have. So anyway, so I did a little chart reading. I'm like, oh, all of these things I already know about myself. I know, I know, I know. Got it. You know, no more babies for me. I'm like, I never thought there was anyway. So like, you know, I asked the questions and got the answers. I like, already kind of knew. And then I had had Reiki forever. And it's like interesting enough that girl, I grew up with her that was doing it. Mm-hmm. So it was like, yeah, she's like, you just have a lot of, what did you say? Air, anxiety, like an air sign, which is, I am not an air sign, but I have a lot of air sign. She's like, so she's like, I pulled the card for you too. And she's like, I can tell your work isn't really what you want to do. And she's like crying. She's like, yeah, cause I know you, it's weird. And I'm like, no, it's totally fine. So, okay. I'm not taking care of myself. I got it. And my work is not what I love. So what the heck am I doing? And then, you know, as she was doing Reiki, I was listening to like her yoga nidra and like relaxing and oils and all that cool stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, my body's totally vibrating because it's not connected. I can tell it's not. So within the next couple of months, I started being like, I just need to get up in the morning and do something before. So I, I've been trying to more often than not get up and do some yoga, meditation, journaling, pulling cards, those type of things. Because I am more balanced when I do them. And then mm-hmm. that friend that that was there that I knew, um, I followed her on Instagram. And so she works somewhere where she does like human design charts where it's like astro astrology and all these things together. So then I've had a couple sessions with her just to try to really focus on like, what is it that I should be doing? Because I sometimes would be like, oh, I like helping people, but I don't like how I'm helping them or where I'm helping them. And then that affects everything else, right? Like taking care of your kid, if you don't, your job is kind of angry and like, eh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, so I found yeah. that I need to be a peaceful person. 
<laughs> Do you want to talk a little bit about what you are feeling drawn to now? Yeah. So like when we met, I was doing you were where you worked on the palliative care team and there was a doc. I don't even remember how I met her. Yeah. Oh, so interesting. So that's how it kind of, I was, I'm an occupational therapist in the hospital. Um, some of the, I work mental health. So I've always done that. That is what I went to school to do, but it's very like rigid and like, kind of like, you can't do what you want in the hospital the way that we learned in school, right? Oh, it's going to be great. You can do all this stuff like, well, no, you can't. So there's OTs that work in the ICU or the CICU. And this one OT would always ask me to come see patients down there because she's like really good at coping skills, yada, yada, yada. So I would see people that she's like, I want to be physical, but their anxiety is out of control. And so I guess I was in with somebody one day and then when the social worker on your team, like saw me working with them, and was like, what are you doing? How do you do this? I was like, well, this is just what we do. So I met with her and some of the other people on the team. And then that doctor that you're talking about that was like, you need to meet Jamie, whatever. So she was like, I want to meet her. And so I met her and I like told her all these things. I'm like, why can you guys not do these things? Here's a bunch of research saying you can, like, that's what you guys should be doing. I don't get it. Um, so then she would have me see patients and I would do Reiki mm -hmm. and I would do whatever coping skills. And then I went to your guys' team and talked. That's when I met you. I was like, I sat next to you somehow. And then I was like, and this girl knows how to do Reiki too. And not you were like, <laughs> I, remember I was like, sorry, nobody knew. So that was before. Wait, can you pause for a moment and just tell yeah. listeners what Reiki is in case oh. people are listening and don't know what right. it is? So They're it's a like, Japanese like relaxation technique is how I say. So um, it's your, you're channeled by someone who is a master to bring in God's life force energy through you into the recipient. So you're helping balance the chakras, the energies in their body for whatever it is. So the way that I would do it would be intuitively. I, I, Sometimes I move around, sometimes I just send it wherever they need it. But I always, I like to be touching them, like I said, I internal sensor. So I like to feel the energy and the vibrations. So you, I'm level two, going on to be a level three, so I can attune people next month. Wonderful. Yes. So anyway, I forgot where I was at telling that story of how I met you. Oh, and in the hospital. So then I kind of thought I want to be a behavior specialist or whatever. So I kind of went that route. I worked in that a couple of years. Like, eh, it was like, this is not what I love. I don't know, but I kind of got put in this position. So I had to do it, but then COVID hit. And then it was like, oh, we can't afford to have you do that. Go be an OT again. So I did that, but I'm, I was like, I'll go do it on the adolescent unit. And that's just what I've been doing since, but it's not, you know, I'm able to see now that I can't force. I'm not someone who's meant to force what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to wait for it to come, to respond to things like lately I've had, you know, I can respond to the things that are coming and I need to sit out and wait and write my pros and cons list. And that will help me be able to like not push my way through, which is not really, because I might push into something I don't want, which is I have done in the past. But when I was working with my colleagues, I'm like, no, that's what I really like to do. People are dying, people are suffering. I can sit with them. I can just be there or it's like do you want me to do like a hand massage I can put lotion on I can bring aromatherapy I can do Reiki whatever like that's I feel like the most connected to or that is the thing I'm supposed to do and as I've been reading the books on like uh, death doula or soul midwives I'm like what this is like totally what I'm supposed to do I can I want to do that that's like what I'm supposed to do and as I was talking to my friend who does like the readings and things she was like one time I'm like I guess I could help people have babies she's like oh no oh no like you're supposed to be with the dead people looking at my planets and where my you know everything is like no you're supposed to be helping the dead people like moving them through and I was like well that's what I feel like but I, mm -hmm. I just need to wait for it because it's not the time and I feel like a lot of people in cult in our culture are very like afraid of death we don't talk yes. about death a lot right. a lot of people yeah. aren't comfortable with it right. do you feel like that's something that's been like innate in you and it's just sort of been awakened or are there times in your life when you haven't been comfortable with death and now you there was transition into right. being comfortable I think I've always been comfortable with it it's one of those weird like we're like weird person but um <clears throat> no I'm um, I'm a weird person with you so yeah so whatever you like that so I, my first experience was probably like a pet, like most people have a pet that die, right? So I don't know. I had a pet die. My second pet that died, I totally like lost it. You know, it's like, cause I wasn't there. He died and I was gone. And, and then my grandma died and I was like, oh, I just remember being like at her funeral and like seeing her body and being like, weird. Like, that's not her. Her body's painted up with makeup and it's like, not her. Weird. But, and then as I, I got older and I worked like, 
So I became a nursing assistant when I was like 19 at a nursing home. Like I learned there and I had the same patient like all week as my patient. And then I come in Friday and they're like, so-and-so died last night. I was like, what? Oh, now that I look back, she had the signs of someone who's dying. Everything tastes bitter, you know, just kind of delirious. But I was only 19. I didn't know, but I wasn't uncomfortable being around that. I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. Then I got a job working as a nursing assistant in like a rehab facility. So-and-so died last night. What? Oh, she was saying this and that. Or I had a patient who experienced death and came back. And I'm like, tell me about that. What was it like? Oh my God, that's so cool. Um, yeah. And then when my, I was 25 and my grandpa was dying and um, he was in the hospital. He was like 95. My cousins were down. I'm like, let's go to the hospital and see him. And they're like crying and bawling. I'm like, hey, you want something to eat? You know, I'm feeding him. Once again, everything tastes bitter. And I'm like, this is familiar. And then he's like, we're in Seattle, right? No, we're not in Seattle. You know, I'm just like, we're in Spokane, you're you're funny. And as we leave, my cousins are bawling going, oh my God, how can you even like do that? How can you, like, I'm like, I don't know. I just do it. Like old people, they're dying. I mean, it doesn't feel uncomfortable to me. And then obviously at the hospital, my grandma died. I would go see her every once in a while. She had dementia too, but I didn't have as much of a connection to her as I did to my grandpa, so it was just different. I was like, yeah, you know, she didn't always recognize me anyway. But yeah, I've always, I've never really had that. Like, it would it's sad to lose people, but mm-hmm. if you believe that there's a soul that can return or that you can always connect to, um, yeah, they do come talk to you if you want ask them to. Mm-hmm. And yeah. so then I yeah, and I found that death doula when I was doing like um, the behavior analyst work because I was working with a lot of older people because these old people get stuck in the hospital. I was like, well, that sounds cool. I just kind of shoved it under the table until for a while until like um, it just came up in the last like year. I was like, oh, that does make sense. And that's what I'm supposed to do. And so I've always kind of been okay with it. And I've been around a lot of people that, you know, are losing people or seeing the people in the hospital that are dying. And I just want to be like, you can go, but your family won't let you. So you're staying around. So I never really have been like, you know, I guess the last experience around someone that was really like, oh, this is what I'm supposed to do is my best friend's dad was in the hospital right when COVID hit. COVID hit so no one could visit. I mm-hmm. just saw on Facebook, her older sister was like, oh my gosh, my dad's in the hospital. If anybody works there, can they go see him? And so I was like, oh, okay. So I went, he was in the ICU. He had, had, uh, he had a fall. And so he was like, brain dead. I walked past the room and I was like, oh, he's gone. Like I just started like, oh, he's gone, he's gone, he's gone. So then I called her and she was like, yep, he, they're going to try to do an MRI and see if he's still there. And I was like, well, he's not. So they should pull a plug. Like he, he's not been there probably for like days. Yeah. So I'm like, I can tell the key's on. So he, he did end up passing away. And then I did have a recent thing with my friend. Um, she, um, her son's a couple months old now, but she didn't, she wanted me to come visit. And I knew I was like, oh man, if I, he has some genetic stuff, I'm like, it has some holes in his heart and stuff. I'm like, if I put the feeling that he's going to die, I don't want to do it. So I'm like, it's a baby. I don't want to work with babies. Don't want to, yeah. So I did go there and I'm like, okay, he's not going to die, but he's going to have lots of health problems. Like he's going to be a sick kid, you know, come to find out he does have some issues with more than like they knew. So I was like, ooh. So I just have that, like, I can tell. <laughs> I can walk in there and they're going to die. But I didn't have enough courage to be around people that were dying. I think that was what I was missing was like the courage that I, or the belief that I knew what I was doing and mm-hmm. that I, that what I was feeling was right. So as I've gotten older, that intuition is kind of like, okay, I'm sensing it. I'm feeling it. You are, you are right about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just working with someone that's like, no, this is really, you really do have that ability. You really are an intuitive person. Whereas probably yeah. got shut down when I was younger when we just are you know, saying things or doing things that people don't like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And from your perspective and understanding what, um, what have you experienced with, like, have you been present when a person takes their last breath? Is there like a shift of spirit? Have you, I haven't been there yet. That's what I really want to do because I know that it would probably have read about it, but I'm like, I got to get, I got to get volunteering at hospice. Well, you know, the other thing too, I forgot, my aunt did die like two years ago. And so she was on hospice because she had cancer. And so like, I did go sit with her and I was giving her Reiki when she was like passing and she was on the meds. So she was sedated. 
but she still responded to like, we're in the room alone. And then she still did respond with her eyebrow raises. Like when I would say things to her. So I was like, mm-hmm. they're still there until they go. Mm-hmm. So I wasn't there. I, d- I thought she was going to live a little bit longer, but, but during that night after I like two hours after I left, like my cousin was like, no, mom, it's time for you to go. So that's, she needed to hear it from them. I just thought mm-hmm. she was going to wait for one of her siblings to get here, but she was like, no, I'm out. I'm out. So I haven't been there, but I would really like to do because I feel like that would be important. But I mean, I have had, um, one of my friends actually from work died last almost a year ago and I feel like his spirit stuck because he has come and talked to me like I know his niece so I'm like yeah so there is that part of the work where you help them go back because or help the family release them mm-hmm. but some people are stuck in the because of whatever's holding them back or they didn't die the way they wanted to or should have mm-hmm. yeah so there is that like the that part of it too it's a little more maybe out there but Yes. And when these spirits that are no longer earthside are speaking to you and what, um, how does that look or feel or sound to you? Um, so usually I'm like meditating. And so it would be like that thing where like, it's not, it's like talking to yourself, but not because you're like, so what I feel is like energy coming at me. And so now that I know I'll be like, and I'm not scared and it's not frightening. I'll be like, okay, who is this? Who is it? And so then it's like my friend said his name. I'm like, okay, so what do I, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? And so then he said, tell so-and-so that I'm fine and that I love her. And then I'm going to come back when she has a baby. And I'm like, all right. I send her the message. She's like, shut up. <laughs> I was just thinking about him. I needed to hear that. You know, like that was somebody she, her uncle that she lived with. So this whole cool thing, it's like, okay. And then when I see her in person, she's like, I went to a psychic lady or she sees a psychic lady. And she's like, Hey, and I saw your uncle with this girl with red hair. And I'm like, she was like, I didn't think about it at the time, but he was with you. And I was like, okay. She's like, so you're doing what you need to do. I'm like, okay, that refer- like reassures me. Like, okay, I'm on that track. So yeah, I always just feel like an energy push is coming at me. And if I start having anxiety, then I feel like that's like a not good spirit. But if it's like, I'm calm and it's coming, or I will say like, I don't want any bad ones. Because sometimes at night, like I get like panic about it. And I don't know if it's because when I was a kid, like, I didn't share a room with anyone and my parents kind of locked their door at night. And it's like, I'd be awake. I know I'd wake up sometimes and be like, okay, I need somebody. Where are you? Where's my cat? I'd go to my brother's room or I'd be like sleeping outside the door. So there was probably always something that kind of like was there, but I didn't know. Mm-hmm. Is that energy that no one tells you about? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. The unseeables that are mm-hmm. like hard for us to really describe and talk about. Yeah. And yeah. So I feel like it's like energy coming at. Like I said, I'm an internal sensor and I the vibration stuff. Everybody has a different like super sense. Mm-hmm. So that's mine. <laughs> um, it sounds like you're sort of, it's like you're in this place where you are having these affirmations of death work and mm-hmm. um, also sort of like allowing the path to unfold in front yeah. of you. Mm-hmm. Um, have you had any specific sort of like visions or thoughts about what you feel you're your soul work, your life's path will be a few years from now? Yeah. So kind of working on that, but I, so I do know, like, so from that work I've done with my friend, it like tells you like your life path. And so like mine is like the path, life path six. And then it's like the path of peace because I usually, I have had, you know, problems like not being at peace, right. Cause I'm not accepting it was going on now. So that is the path. And then I'm very, I can, be very peaceful and I don't really get rocked very much when I'm with people that are like that are having issues like I could stand there on the side unit and someone's having a meltdown and throw on stuff and I'd be like oh okay that's just what's happening right now mm-hmm. I don't feel like I'm gonna get hurt if I did I would probably move so I feel I I don't I know for sure there's certain parts of the death doula work or the end of life doula that I want to do and I really would rather do some of the like training families and teaching them like this is the process and I'm fine with sitting here and like holding space for you and then showing you how to do like using the oils or incense or whatever those things are and like just helping them help them pass peacefully or just you know helping them move on if they're stuck I feel like that's you know one of those things too if I would have known more about this in the hospital there was probably a few patients that I was seeing for palliative before I probably met you that was like why are they having me see this person oh, I should be telling them to go because they're stuck here and they don't need to be, but no one in their family is willing to say that. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, I'm in there like this person is not even conscious. Like now that I know more about how to do right down someone who's passing, like you want to keep it above the solar plexus because otherwise you can keep them stuck if you do it below. Like I didn't, I didn't know a lot of that stuff, but yeah, it's like, oh, 
I should be doing that, but how am I going to do it? I don't know. Where am I going to do it? I don't know. <laughs> it might come somewhere I don't even know. I'm just waiting. Absolutely. I don't really respond. <laughs> But that is kind of what I want to do is that helping the families or the person or even people that don't have families, right? Maybe there's somebody needs to sit with somebody that doesn't have anybody. We totally do that too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I remember early in my nursing career, there was an old man in the hospital and he was like, of course, like way at the end of the hall. hall. And he didn't have any family. And so whenever I had a spare moment, I would go and just sit with him as he was nearing the end of his life. Yeah. Yeah. And then just learning how to read the signs and like being able to say, like, no, this is part of it. It's okay. And yeah. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah. And I feel like there are lots of myths around death and dying. You know, yeah. there's a big um hard part in our culture where people have a lot of strong emotion around food and yes. the dying yes. and wanting to feed the dying, even though part of the natural process of dying <laughs> is <laughs> for people to just stop eating naturally. <laughs> right. Um, but that can be very difficult for family members. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's the part where you educate, like, well, here's why they might be stopping the process says that they're going to you mm-hmm. decide they're going to, you know. I understand you want to, what else can you do instead of be like, Hey, instead of that, could you massage their hands and feet or like Mm -hmm. replacing what could you do instead that would make you feel like you're helping or right. Yeah. Yeah. When we actually forcefully feed people who are dying, it makes them more uncomfortable. So right. And then they can, Mm -hmm. that's what keeps them stuck. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm learning that and I'm going to take a class on that next month as well. How exciting. Yeah. Yeah. You're like right on your path. Right on my path. Being peaceful presence. Yeah. I'm getting there. It's hard to do sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. What else? Yeah. What else? Um, when do you feel most wild and alive? <laughs> I don't know. Wild and alive. <sighs> I'm probably a loner. I really do like to be alone. Sometimes, but with our logo, I can be super myself and be fun and be free. And, like, yes. and that's that childlike spirit. So I have my North Node in Leo. So I'm supposed to be like a leader and like childish. And so it's hard to do around adults, I think, because we're so like, oh, you're acting slowly. You're being funny. You're being not like an adult. But as I've gotten older, I kind of gone back to that. I've always kind of worked with kids on and off too. And that's part of what keeps you young. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, but wild. So the other thing is, do I have like an open heart center? So I'm going to take on whatever group I'm with. I'm going to do what they're doing. So if I'm alone, I probably do and most myself, but I don't know that I'm necessarily wild, but well, I guess I will tell you my grandpa did give me the name wildfire. So I must, must have been so I am wild sometimes. I can't think of any specifics right now. (laughs) That's okay. Is there anything else that is stirring your soul right now? Um, I can't think of anything. That's basically it. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot already that you've shared with death and, um, walking towards that path. Oh, so there is some other things I've been doing. So, you know, we have this body and old trauma and all those things. And so it kind of goes along with, um, the birthing process and all of that is like, so I've done cranial sacral therapy and I found a woman who does that. And she also, we kind of does talks about like this feels like it's from your past life but doesn't feel like it's from this you know or you're holding on to someone else's you know anger and your liver doesn't feel like yours so um as I, I was working with her and she's like this but my left side and it's like okay my left side what is it about this that's holding me back this shoulder is all uh, from having a baby or nursing or whatever and I'm like mm-hmm. no it's directly connected to when um that doctor like snipped me because once I was like that's what it's from it went <sighs> And like went away. I was like, motherfucker, you took my power. So I was like, I my shoulders are way better now, but I was holding on to that anger and that like, what the heck? You didn't give me a choice, like mm-hmm. taking it away from me. So yeah. anyway, well, so way to out. take it back. Yeah. yeah. I was like, that's what it is. And then my like, oh, arms down. Yeah. So the woman side, you know, the female side of me was like angry at the other side that didn't like say, stop. No. Actually, I didn't have an opportunity. Why do you take that? Mm-hmm. So Anyway, we've done, I've done a lot of work for her and it's really great. So a lot of this stuff was pregnancy related too, but like that was mm-hmm. the last one that finally went and we're like, we're good. I know you and I have talked about like the psoas and the pelvic floor yes. some recently, yes. and I know you got a book and then I got the yes. book and I'm yes. wondering if there's anything you would like to share about that. Yeah. So that can be cause a lot of pain Yeah, from birthing. So I just think the way you birth, if you're actually not uh, having an epidural, you're moving around 
it cause it can cause some trauma while you're birthing not like in a bad way but it's like your body's remembering all that pain and that like movement you went through mm -hmm. so I do have sometimes I have that and we hold trauma there just in general if you ever had you know like the fight or flight it can be tight in there. Yeah. And even if you it. have an epidural and you're not oh, that's feeling the pain, you uh, yeah. still so are have the physical. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I've even like people that haven't had babies, I've worked on like teenagers with trauma, and that's right where their back hurts. Mm -hmm. And it's just life, I think, stress too. So, working on those psoas, even them loosened up, is very helpful. Yeah. I haven't really worked on mine a lot, but there is, I see two different kinds of people. One that does like the, Ooh, crazy, you know, stuff that will be like weird. And then the one that does like the traditional one. So my right side, so as is a little bit tighter, but I think that's the, the one from the other trauma that I was like holding on to for so long. Mm -hmm. That side is a little bit better, but you can work on it and it makes you feel like you're um, crunching forward. So you'll notice like you're not standing up tall because it's pulling your, your rib cage down. Mm -hmm. so sometimes you're like walking around kind of hunched and your head's forward <laughs> you're uh so as our need some work yes I have been I've been trying to consciously like yeah be aware of it be aware yeah. of it and give it mm -hmm. time and energy and space yes. and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so any nice. trauma can be held in there and so that's the thing too is like while you're doing like movements laying there and like what comes up I don't think you need to necessarily like be freaked out about it you just notice mm -hmm. it and you go okay I'm done with you okay, go away. You know, like stuff comes up. Like I said, I was doing great. Like that. Oh, that's from when he snipped me. It's gone. And that's usually how I do it. Like I'll be having a session and, and then I'll be like, Oh, that's weird. What's that feeling? What's that feeling? And I'll, the thought or whatever it was came, comes up of like, that was from whenever this happened, like your car accident. Oh, there it goes. But it's different when it's like, Oh, this is from a past life. So that was <laughs> that one girl. She's like, what did you just see? And I go, a train. And she's like, so did I. It's like, oh, and my, I got hit by a train, you know, like then your part of your body that you've been holding on to releases or like you got blown up in war. And then it's like, oh, unwinds. So I've had numerous past lives and every time I've been trauma traumatizing, I was holding it into my body in different spots. Wow. Anyway, super cool stuff. Yeah, no, Helpful. it's so wonderful to hear about. I haven't had as much like connection with past lives, although I know like I feel it at times and yep. yeah, um, I definitely feel like I've been a birth worker and a death worker yeah. in past lives, yep. especially the too. birth, but I but, also yeah. feel the death connection and like yeah. the circle of life that yes. they're both, they're two sides of the same thing. Like they we are. all are born and we all die. Like, yes. Yeah. And so some of that stuff too, after I never probably would have, I feel like having a child or having a baby like is going to bring up trauma, whether it's this lifetime or, la or, or another one. Cause I was like, I don't really have a lot of other trauma. That's why I'm like, why am I stuck? But like your body went, my body went back to this place. Like after it's like, remember this, you need to let it go, mm -hmm. go find someone who can help you. Yeah. And I feel like too, I was like reading the, the soul midwife book. I'm like, Oh yeah, I totally was like, really, really walked around there with their blue outfits with their little, you know, little sight things. And like, cutting people's cords and letting them free. Yeah. I was like, that totally feels like something I probably did. Yes. But yeah. It's hard to get to that place though. It is kind of weird to like do a meditation or to have like a feeling that was like yours, but not from right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. Yes. Oh, you shared so much wisdom, so many yeah. insights today. I'm yeah. so grateful for you, for people who are listening or watching and like, how can I get in contact with her and talk to her more? <laughs> or like, does she do sessions? If people have these questions, they might. Is um, I do have an Instagram. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at Wild. Cool. Is it, yeah, what is my name? You can send it to me, and I'll put it in the show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I always forget my name. Yeah, I'm not really on there a lot. That's like, well, I name it that because I'm like, at some point, that's probably going to be my my thing, right? Your business, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Your mamapreneurship my mom a premier. that's what we're all doing right yes at uh oh it's like at jamie wildfire isn't that what it is jamie wildfire i think that's right oh jamie dash what jamie underscore wildfire yep okay and then yeah and then you have my email if somebody wanted it mm -hmm. uh, okay yeah anyway yeah awesome so that. cool well thank you for being here and oh, thank you all that. for tuning in and yeah. Yes. Be brave, be bold, be love. That's right. <laughs> <laughs>